From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I'm your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We'll provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis. This is going to be your go-to resource for everything FPNA. Today, I am thrilled to welcome our guest, Casey Wu. Casey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Paul. Yeah, really excited to have you. So a little bit about Casey. Casey is located in Silicon Valley. He uh, went to West Point, and then he graduated from Harvard studying economics. He started his career and spent the first 10 years working on Wall Street, worked for Morgan Stanley, also did some hedge funds, some of the Tiger funds. Last 10 years, he's been working as an executive leader across the gamut with a number of different startups, both as a CFO and a COO, multiple different stages. And he also is the uh, founder of the Operators Guild, which is a preeminent operator Guild around the world. He's also part of uh, Fog Ventures. And I'm going to go ahead and ask him to just give us a little bit more about his background. Uh, thanks, Paul. I mean, he did a pretty good job. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, my, my 20-year work history kind of breaks into first 10 years as military and Wall Street. So pretty classic sell-side path, you know, go to the island called Manhattan, <laughs> get a banking job at Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. Uh, which is amazing training ground. Uh, it was, I met my half my groomsmen there, uh, my wife there, and I uh, learned how to be very good at Excel without a mouse. Right, like those, those are like lifelong things that you take away from that two year program. Uh, and then, uh, of course, after that, most people go to buy side, private equity or hedge funds. I chose the hedge fund side, uh, long short fundamental equity covered consumer retail, so super fun. You know, we're talking about. You know, um, Mattel and Hasbro and Under Armour and, you know, all the consumer products. So I learned a lot about consumer psychology and just had a lot of fun there. Uh, but then after those, you know, after being in Wall Street, which was like what you strive to do for so long as an economics major, you're told that's the pinnacle. Like you'd be an investor in, in Manhattan. And I was very fortunate. You know, I would say at Via Central Park, my uh, corner office was bigger than my shoebox apartment. There's really nothing to complain about. But I was really unfulfilled. And it took me a while to figure out why. And why was I realized I missed my team. The military is a team sport. Banking is a team sport. Hedge fund investing is not. So when you, t when you tell me corner office, I think lonely. <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually think cool. I mean, don't get me wrong. The office is cool. Um, the second thing I realized in hindsight is I love to build things. Um, which I think operators understand that. Um, as a lawyer, banker, auditor, investor, for the most part, you transact, you advise, consultant. Okay. Um, but I realized I want to get in the action. So anyways, after 10 years, I took a big pay cut, joined a 10-person startup, FinTech SaaS, in New York or Silicon Alley. <laughs> and I loved it. it. It just like, you know, it's like, what gives you energy? Um, so from there, I, I had a mantra. If you want to do something, go where the best in the world are. If you want to cook, you should go to Paris. If you want to invest, you should go to New York. If you want to do film, you should go to LA. If you want to do tech, you got to go to the Bay Area. Um, so I, I came out here. I learned very quickly finance was a second-class citizen. <laughs> um, and I know that because, I mean, one of the I – will, I, I will leave this – Decacorn, more than a Decacorn startup unnamed as they were 65 people. I went in, they kicked me out and I was just looking for, I was like, I'll take any job here. I want to work here. Don't care about the pay. And they said, you don't have a CPA, so you don't qualify for finance. I'm like, I don't even know where to begin with that statement. Um, as an investment professional on Wall Street. Okay. Um, so basically you go from top of the totem pole finance, air quote finance in Wall Street to Hey, here's my uh, meal receipt. You know, are you the bookkeeper? Which, once again, nothing wrong with bookkeepers, but I, that's not what I do. Um, and if you ask them what a controller or CFO was, they would say the same. Right? It's I'm I'm being a little facetious here, but that's sure. Essentially yep. it was what it was. And there, I always say there's 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 three people that matter in Silicon Valley when I came ten years ago: the people who fund it, VCs; yep. the people who build it, product engineering; the people who sell it, 
sales and marketing. Notice I did not say finance, ops, HR, talent, legal, IT. Air quote, back office. So anyways, uh, so to fast forward the story, uh, I got lonely. And I said, you know what? Uh, I changed careers. This is an uphill battle. And I was invited to a group of nine people that were VPs of finance and ops who shared this misunderstood, misfit, mutant feeling. And I said, hey, do you guys want to like just meet every month, create a little like support group? Um, think of it like a mom's group, you know, like same thing, um, shared hardship. And, uh, and they said, yeah. I said, okay, cool. And was, I, I co-founded it uh, with uh, Jamie Seglars who uh, invited me to that much. And I sent around a Google Doc with, I uh, said, there's only five rules. Number one, no promotion or solicitation. Number two, leave your ego at the door. Uh, number three, what's said here stays here. Uh, number four, give more than you get. And number five, operators only. Uh, that nine is now 700 today. We can go into that, what that is, but it is one of the most amazing accidental communities that have been built. It's called Operators Guild. Um, so we'll get into that later. But anyways, to finish my background, so for the last 10 years, I uh, learned the hard way uh, through almost every stage you can imagine, seed, A, B, C, D, 10 person to 15,000, uh, some of the fastest company growing uh, growth companies in the world like we were, to companies that had to be spun down and I fired myself and closed the door behind me. Um, all the way from SaaS, pure SaaS companies to tech enabled operating um, from marketplace to B2B to B2C, um, from every sales channel, partnership, direct, self serve. So, really kind of went through every kind of battle and tour of duty I could. Uh, and then, lastly, last two years, uh, Operators Guild created their investment arm, which is one of the coolest things that's ever happened. Is We are the angel syndicate arm that only operators can be a part of. Um, it has been incredibly successful and additive to both our tier one VC partners and to companies building the next operator tool set, especially in CFO tech. Uh, and that's me. Great. Now, I appreciate that overview. A lot there sounds very fascinating. Why don't we start a little bit? You know, you talked a little bit more about, you know, your uh, transition from investment banking, you know, moving to corporate finance, but maybe a little bit of what that was like and what you saw as kind of the key differences when you made that switch. There's many, but I will share like a big one. What I realized when you're in air quote Wall Street banking, investing you know, for as long as I was, and that's the only kind of jobs I knew besides the military, you think you get, you forget the fact that there's different types of people in the world. Now, what does different types mean? <laughs> Type is not race. Type is not gender. I actually see people, in, I mean, in one angle is a corporate breed. Are you in a, the accounting breed, the controller breed, the inside sales breed, enterprise sales breed? Are you the visionary CEO or the narcissist CEO breed? Are you the strategic CFO? Are you the corporate CFO? They all speak, here it is, punchline, different languages. So my joke is, you think you're speaking English. I'm fluent in English. That's not the language that's spoken in startups. So what I mean by that is to use these uh, weird analogies I have is like uh, make it up. So if we're all breeds of animals, in Wall Street, there is investors and executive assistants. There's only two types of breeds. So let's call investors rhinos. I don't know. Like, so when I'm talking to another investor, we're talking the same language. I have a horn. You have a horn. And it just it's all good. I stepped over to startups. It's a zoo. I didn't realize I was talking to a giraffe and then a flamingo and then, a, but I'm using my horn and all of a sudden I'm like, why aren't we getting this done here? Why don't you understand? So over time where I became a much more successful CFO and operators, I started to become Google Translate. I am now multilingual. <laughs> if I'm speaking to controller, I have a very different language than an engineer, which is very different than the head of marketing. And all of a sudden, things got done. All of a sudden, life got better. So the biggest difference when you move from like a banking Wall Street startup is a one or two species biosphere to a 50 
species. And you better pick up languages fast. I, I love the way you describe that and the analogy there and just, you know, the different languages, right? Being able to work with all kinds of different people to be successful because it's so important. One of the uh, great lessons I learned, I did a great leadership program when I used to be involved in uh, a Boy Scout organization and they taught a lot about situational leadership and how you work with teams. And it's just so true. Everybody's different. You know, at this stage, you need to be doing this or with this type of person, you need to approach it this way. And, you know, that's an invaluable skill. So I really, I appreciate you sharing that because sometimes, you know, we hear the, hey, focus on Excel or focus on this. And those are all good things to have. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a fundamental understanding of people and it's, how different people think, you're limiting yourself. It's all about people. In fact, when you know, you know these business books and these health books, I'm like, why is everything about psychology? <laughs> like, what, what happened to corporate finance and SWOT analysis? Oh, I learned that's, no, it's <laughs> all about influence, motivation, communication, people. I learned that the hard way early on. I pitched an idea early in my career and thinking, well, it makes sense. So they'll all buy into it. Not realizing I actually had to influence people. I'm smart. <laughs> exactly. and it was a disaster. And that was a reminder yeah, that, yeah, it's about influence. It's not about a great idea. There's a lot well, more to it. You have a great example, which is you assume that you understood it and liked it, that they would. That means you assume they're also the same breed and species. <laughs> yep. But you're right. If you meet another, for example, if you're an accountant and you like it, generally speaking, another accountant will think the same as you, generally speaking. Yep. Right. But if you talk to a salesperson, maybe, maybe not. You know, so once you realize there are different breeds, all of a sudden the world gets more sensical. To totally agree. I, I appreciate that. So can you talk a little bit more about the Operators Guild? You mentioned how that started. You have 700 people. So maybe just kind of you know, give us an overview of what that's all about and how that can help, you know, finance, operators, FP&A people, that kind of thing. Uh, operators Guild is like any other association. Uh, it's a shared hardship understanding group where there's a very high relevance when it comes to if you are, uh, so the demographics of the Operator Guild, uh, the middle of the bell curve. So we have 700 people at the middle of the bell curve are uh, director VP C-level seniority. Mm -hmm. It's high growth VC backed companies. Um, so mostly tech. Uh, there's tech enabled operating, but you know, it's not like coal lines and pizza shops, right? It's more techie. 70% um, Bay Area, 30% rest of the world. Uh, and obviously the tech hubs, London, Miami, New York, um, Boulder, um, Austin, et cetera. Uh, in terms of swim lanes of roles, we're talking early stage CEO. CFO, COO, business operations, and strategy. Oh, and supply chain ops. And so, so of course, you know, and, and, the, and the roles beneath them, right? So FP, yeah. et, cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera, It has been an incredibly successful uh, mission uh, because it stemmed from a problem I was solving myself, which is one, therapy. <laughs> I so if you think about it, like moms have moms groups, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? They have, they have a group. Um, CEOs have YPO. The, the, the number of CEO groups, founder group, right? Yep. Where's ours? Where is the, I'm going to air quote, number twos, number threes. If you think CEOs lonely, number twos are also very lonely. Or I know I'm using air quote number two, right? But sure, like, yeah. Those are, we're not the number one, right? Yep. Um so we have the same human needs, which is to be understood. So the other thing about operators, the, this, this demographic I just described, we are not sales, legal, engineering. What, what do I mean by that? Those are very clear what they are. When you say VP finance and ops, now, of course, for people that don't understand what we do, which is a, a lot of people, finance, I know what you do. You do my T&E report. Oh, I know what you do. You do DCF analysis. Oh, I know what you do. You do Excel. You do the budget. Now, anyone listening to this call will probably tell you, um, that's kind of what I do, but probably like one one hundredth of what I do. So it is the, it is the simple mis uh, misunderstanding. It's, it's kind of like a mom's group. You ask them what dads misunderstand what moms do, right? That's why dads aren't invited to mom's group. Or it's, it's, it's a very, very simple, like misunderstood but we understand each other. So we are this nebulous glue 
in the middle that is important but misunderstood. So anyways, Aubrey Hill helps with jobs. Um, we share all the best jobs. It helps with, the coolest thing is um, Q&A. So we have, I, I did the math, 10,000 years of operating experience on a single email. The immediacy, accuracy, potency of answers that can come within an hour. Because the, the rule is you can't live every life. You can't live every job. And we always are faking until we make it, right? In a weird way. Like where it's a new problem. Mm-hmm. But together we can cover 90% of all your problems. By yourself, good luck. So that's really that. We have incredible social events. We're built around friendships and relationships. We're not built around, hey, the quarterly dues are coming up. You attending the Friday CFO panel? Like, <laughs> I never really liked that type of community, right? Yes, we have dues because there's, it costs something to, you know, to run it, but it's fun and it's extremely helpful. And I think, you know, we have a very high MPS. Uh, it's been 95% word of mouth for seven, eight years. We don't have a marketer or a salesperson. So anyways... It's extremely organic and pure, authentic. That's operators still. Oh, and then we're in 22 cities. Uh, sounds like a, a great program. We'll definitely put that in the show notes so people who want to go look at that. I know when I had, knew you were going to come on the show, I went and looked at it a little bit and it sounded you know fascinating. So I really enjoyed hearing more about that. But something you said around operators, you know, obviously I know you've done a, the CFO role, the COO role. You know, I was having a conversation with someone who works a lot in RevOps, runs a business around that. And we were talking about, you know, hey, well, where's FP&A end and what role is RevOps and what is sales ops? And he's like, you know, we someone should really put together a Venn diagram with kind of best practice of how they should be separated or some kind of framework. And we talked about it and I haven't found time to do something like that. But I'm curious, what's your take of, you know, and I know it varies between every company so much. What is FP&A's response? So how do you think about all that? I know exactly the the riddle that you are are proposing and and I know, and by the way, this is why we exist as a group is because if it were an easy Wikipedia, you know, look it up, we'd be understood. Um, of course we all know the answers. It varies. Yep. Um, what I do, it depends on what angle you want to cut it, but at the end of the day, uh, I'm, I'm working on a medium post for this, by the way. So I don't have a lot of things to write about, but this one I, I want to document with, which is basically, uh, the biggest distinctions between, you know, when you're talking about where does it sit, you know, the one, one, one cut is functional versus cross-functional. Mm-hmm. Uh, cross-functional is HR, you know, cross-functional is legal, cross-functional is finance, right? And then obviously functional is sales and engineering. So that's a, that's a clear distinction. So for example, the, then it goes, well, what's the, what is the role of cross-functional? The role of cross-functional is a support functional. I am in service of my employees. Notice my customers aren't the customers of the business as a CFO. My customers are sales, are the mm-hmm. employees, right? Are the CEO. Yep. So that's that so right there, that's a framework. So when you say what's RevOps? Well, RevOps, I think, supports revenue and has a corporate lens. Sales ops supports sales. So mm-hmm. sales ops sits in a functional group under the CRO. Yep. Right? Yep. And they report to you now. For example, who owns commissions? Not sales ops. Like you can't do that, right? You can't. There's, there's a very general conflicts of interest and honest broker type framework. So where things sit in finance or central is what I deem honest broker. Things that require end-to-end visibility, like LTV CAC, can only be calculated by finance because marketing doesn't have all the information and sales doesn't have all the information. Finance can see it all, can do it, right? So there's also just the logical nature of if you want to ask someone to do company KPIs or company related matters, they should sit in cross-functional because they need to access different functions and vice versa. So anyways, that's not a Venn diagram, but that's how I would start drawing it. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. No, but that, you yeah. did. And that makes a lot of sense how you laid it out there. I get it. The, which one's functional, which is cross-functional, which needs to be at a corporate level conflict of interest, you know, kind of managing all those different things to help to decide this should slot down here yeah. and should slot over there. And if you're the yeah. FBI, you need to access all the 50 states. Yeah. So you don't sit in Massachusetts. You report to the federal government, right? And then, you know, if you, so it's, it's, if you're state versus federal, it's, it's, it's very similar. Um, though some states want to get the federal power. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, truth to that for yeah, sure. Yeah, 
you know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. Data Rails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Data Rails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex, consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So one more question here. So you've talked about Operators Guild. Can you talk a little bit about Fog Ventures? You know, kind of how you got involved in that, how that came about. Yeah, Fog Ventures is probably one of the most fun things that came about from Operators Guild. Um, so as mentioned, Operators Guild is now about 700 people. We are very um, Switzerland, what's said there stays there, community, no advertisement type of thing. Of course, we have sponsors or, or organization. What happened was, just like what happened with HR, finance started to matter. Now, what I mean by that, who, who really mattered all the time was VCs, product engineers, and salespeople. They've always mattered. Yep. But the whole, like, are you an accountant? What does FP&A do? Like, uh, HR, are you the sexual harassment police? Like, you know, it's, 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 it's a very back office non-strategic lens that, for the most part, in startups, that's what, you know, that second class is and uh, yep. setup was not. Over time, that has changed. HR is now called people. You know, you have half million dollar chief people officers at startups. It is a strategic C-level, C-at-the-table function that reports to CEO. That is a nod to the value and recognition of the people function. What happened is that has finally happened for finance. We're no longer the show me how the book's closed. Just keep me out of jail, people. We're actually, oh my God, strategic. Bring finance in the room if we need to make a decision about something. Unit economics, that matters. Right, so the startup industry has gotten a lot more sophisticated, where it's not just about a good product. Okay, mm-hmm. so what happened? And you're like, what? Did, actually, about fog. What are you talking about? <laughs> what happened? What, what happened was OG was a place for talent. VCs would reach out and say, "Hey, uh, we have an opening for a CFO or a C- CEO spot," and all of a sudden, it went to, "Can you take a look at this deal?" I was like, "Why would I look at a deal? I'm a CFO because it's a CFO tool." Hey, Casey, it's really weird. This is like the seventh CFO tool that has been presented to me and the other six VCs that called you in the last month. And you're just, you just crack a smile and you're like, we matter now. We matter. Bill.com, not good enough. NetSuite, not good enough. And a plan, good 20 years ago. Wow. They have come to innovate for us. So the light bulb went off and they said, I said, they're asking you because we're not CFO. So how do we validate this? And I turned to my operator friends and said, who wants to angel invest? And the coolest thing happened. We created Fog Ventures. It's separate than Operators Guild. You don't have to be part of Operators Guild to be part of Fog. Fog stands for, for Operators Guild. And <laughs> it's kind of cute, right? In San Francisco, Fog. But anyways, it's super fun because most syndicates um, are money pools. So uh, for example, um, a DoorDash syndicate or an Uber syndicate or fantastic, but their association is they've worked at an employer. Ours is designed to be a persona. So the only people that can be in fog are operators, mostly CFOs, COOs, CEOs, heads of people. Why does that matter? Because as a syndicate, we are an incredible distribution arm or advisory arm. So if you're building a HR product, a CFO product, an FP&A product, an operator product, who better to pitch to than 700 CFOs and COOs who also want to invest in you? So it's kind of like, I don't know, a new mom's product, you pitch it to a mom's group 
And let me tell you, they will give you the real feedback you want. And by the way, mm-hmm. if they pull out their money out of their pocket to invest, that says a lot. Yes. So it is a no-brainer. It's a super lad. It is immediate validation. It's great feedback. And by the way, then the VCs follow. Oh, all the moms like the new mom product? That is what matters. Because everyone pitches that they matter. So anyways, ask the customer. So we, bottom line is we invest SPV deal by deal um, into the best companies in the world alongside tier one VCs who are kind enough to invite us because of the value add we bring. So a truly strategic, valuable check. Any operator um, can be a part of it. Uh, there's no commitment. You can just be there to watch. Um, it's servicing the operator community. Great. No, thank you for sharing that. Sounds like, you know, two great organizations came out of that and it's probably shaped a lot of your career. Help, you know, you do a lot of exciting projects beyond just the day-to-day work. It's been really fun. That's the key word. It's a super fun for, for all of us. Just have fun. That's what we all want. We all want to have fun. I mean, we want to enjoy what we do. None of us want to be miserable. So that's always good to have those type of projects. So I'm curious, you know, you've been a CFO or COO, you know, C-level roles at a couple different companies here, number two or number three in air quotes, as you put it. Did you always want to be that? Like, was or did it just kind of happen? Like, how did yeah, it's, that come it's, about? It's a really good question. I, I love teams. So I'm a very kind of team oriented for the team. So to me, CFO, CEO is, is very in support of. And so there's that, I don't know, enjoyable uh, selflessness. Um, I don't like spotlight generally. So <laughs> I kind of like just do my thing. I love to build. I love to get things done. Um, I think when it comes to being CEO, I think that that's what you're implying. Um, I deem CEO as a whole other level of commitment. And this sounds weird. <laughs> It sounds, obviously you're committed, but to me, generally I think a CEO is founder. So maybe that's my distinction. Sure. Um, that's like a five, 10 year commitment in my opinion. You know, like that is like, you got to be so passionate. It's like mission driven. Yeah, that's what it is. For me to be wanting to be, a, it's a mission driven bleeding and like coming out of my pores. It's not a job because I am that loyal that if I was to like, start or be or take money from someone, I'm, I'm taking it all the way. Right. Um, and I haven't found that yet. Now, maybe it's called fog. Maybe it's OG, but that's why I haven't moved on. Um, but I've definitely thought about being a CEO, um, or leading something, but it, it needs to have the passion first and the, and the mission first. That, I, I get what you're saying there. And I totally agree. You want to have that passion or mission. I know I always wanted to do entrepreneurship, but until I found the right thing, <clears throat> I was like, I'm not going to just go start a pizza pizza joint so I can say I have my own business. Exactly. Like, sure, I can make 80,000, work twice as many hours, and I can go make 150 somewhere else. So why would I do that? And why would and also, I, and I wouldn't yeah, like yeah. it? Fin- the beauty of finance is it's such a portable skill set mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. help other people's visions. And so I get to see and build many different visions. That's really fun until I have a vision that is more exciting than any other that I want to do. So that's the other way is where CEO is not, it's weird. CEO is not as portable as CFO, Mm -hmm. right? There's a specialty to it. This goes back to like the specific mission or passion. And that's another reason why, you know, I I stay where I am because I'm having a lot of fun. Well, that, that makes sense. Stay where you enjoy it. So next question I had for you, you mentioned you love to build. Is that kind of why you've been mostly startup community your whole career is really kind of scaling companies is sounds like a little bit of a passion of yours. Obviously the operators guild fog, you just really enjoy that stage yeah. of companies. I I've spoken to over 1000 operators one-on-one. I am convinced that breed air quote, we love to build. It's addicting translation. We don't like to come into places that are not growing or changing. We don't like to have no impact or little impact, like corporate cog in the wheel. That's why it's generally earlier stage. Sometimes, not almost all the time, some dysfunction, right? It's like something that needs to get changed or fixed. But fast growth equals change equals whatever you was working yesterday. It doesn't work anymore. Translation, build a, build a new thing. But when it comes down to it, it's problem solving. It's the challenge of got a problem. How do you operationalize it and dissolve the problem? Oh, here's another one. And what if you do that and love that, it's like a hunting dog. If you stop hunting, you get bored. 
So people look at it like as work. People look at it as a grind. Is it a grind for a hunting dog? It's just what they do. It's just what they yeah. love. Right. So that's the analogy is, you know, when I got a long sabbatical, I lasted four weeks. <laughs> I was supposed to be nine months. I la- because I realized I had more anxiety, not hunting, so to speak, not building than relaxing every day. So <laughs> it's just like a passion. And I think we all love it. Yeah, no, it's obvious. I can see the passion as you, you talk about things and the excitement you bring. So it's very clear you enjoy it. And that I love talking to people like that because it's so much fun. I learn a lot. So that's great. And I'm, I know our audience will sense that passion as they listen to you speak. So I can well, you're, see you're a very successful builder. I mean, what, what you build is very impressive as well. So congratulations. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. It's been a lot of fun. I've really been enjoying it. It's been a great, great journey. You know, kind of speaking of building and obviously working with some startups in early stage, you know, how do you think FD, FP&A departments are different in a startup? Like what's, what's kind of the key role and how do you think about some of that? When you say startup, I think you're referring to how, a stage. Well, so, early stage companies, yeah. like what, when is the right stage kind of is company startup to have FP&A? How do you think about it in those early days of a company? And as they start to scale, so yeah. just kind of that, that part. So I think there's two aspects. One is that which every company needs. And the second is that which is specific to a company. So the first one, I mean, I'm sure we can all guess, you know, chart of accounts, just organizing your data, cash in, cash out, um, and an operating model. So whatever you are, you'll probably need those. Uh, if the question is when to hire it, it depends on speed and complexity. Uh, I think a big mistake of startups that are growing fast is they hire in-house accounting way too late. Uh, it makes sense in the beginning. In the beginning, of course, it's like the outsourced, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. Because there's like five people in one department. Yep. But as we all know, there's a accounting debt. People, you know, no, no, no pun intended. Um, you know, <laughs> people talk about technical debt. There's accounting debt. Mm-hmm. There's finance debt that people forget about. And that debt builds a lot when you're not paying attention to it. So I think um, in the very beginning, a senior manager, like someone in house that is like full time control of the books, who understands the business, is well worth it. Um, one of each. One FP&A. That's it. Now, generally, FP&A sometimes is owned by the founder, but if they're not financially savvy or that, I think it's worth it to hire a manager level um, at a minimum, okay. and that's it, right? So it sounds like a lot, right? Wow, there's two people; they probably make two, three hundred thousand total. If you're talking about Bay Area startup, so obviously you got to wait for that. But the minute you can, they're well worth it, or an outsourced personal yeah. build operating model. So, so the operating model chart accounts. After that, I always look at the business. Some businesses are payments businesses. Some businesses are marketplaces. So you need, you know, the merchant side. Some are fraud related. Well, guess what? You have to backward solve. So if you're collecting merchant payments all the time on behalf of them, et cetera, you need a team that just does that. So there's a specialist that needs to be hired for that. Uh, Uber needed a lawyer, needed general counsel immediately, right? (laughs) Right, right, because that's what their thing was. There was so after that, it's it's very bespoke to the company, and of course, it's growth based, right? So at a certain point, we all know, you know, it, one person can't be doing AP and AR, right? So they split it, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. But at the very basic, one person to do the model and forecasting, the other to get all of the data reconciled and lined up in the way the business is represented. That all makes sense, and. I think a huge challenge, like you mentioned, starting with that chart of accounts. I can't tell you how many, you know, CFOs and fractional CFOs I talk to that they go in and like spend the first six months cleaning up their data before I can build a budget because the accounting is a complete mess. Because they use an outsourced person part-time who doesn't know the business. Well, one joke I remember is I came in, I looked at the P&L and it was an outsourced account. It was great. And like, yeah, everything's working great. We don't need to touch accounting. I was like, I think we need to bring accounting in. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my God, we spent $300,000 in office supplies like last month. And then I clicked it and it was AWS. (laughs) Yep. I'm like, I mean, come on, let's, let's get an in-house, you know, let's spend another $10,000 and get an in-house person. That totally makes sense. I'm, I'm a big believer now, especially as your finances become much more strategic, as you've mentioned that seat at the table you want it earlier. You want someone who can bring that value and can bring the economics and the financial perspective to the strategy. 
because they'll notice things that people who aren't financial won't notice. And so they can bring tremendous value when you allow them. That's right. So, so what do you think is the, you know, kind of the most critical thing for FP&A to be successful, especially, you know, in, you know, the earlier stage companies, kind of the venture back, a lot of where your experience is, what's most important that FP&A needs to do to make sure they have that seat at the table and they're really helping the business move forward versus being back office? I will sound like a broken record if you've ever heard me talk about this topic, but this is my answer to all of it. Um, I have a mentor who I, I, I borrowed this from. So the analogy is the weather. There are, th I think there's four levels. Uh, there's an underground level and there's level one, level two, level three. So think of it like a pyramid. Um, so under the ground, level one is data. Mm -hmm. Just get the data right. Okay. And so cl clearly the pyramid stacks, right? So you need, you need one layer after the other. Okay. Level one, report the weather. What happened yesterday? You need that data underground. Got it. So level one, get that right. Level two, forecast the weather. Is it going to be stormy? What do you think? Now, everyone gets that, right? Level two. But ironically, it's extremely hard to do level one and level two. Sounds easy. For all the reasons we know, <laughs> not, not easy. Uh, also, the business changes. So the infrastructure changes. So all of a sudden, you go back to underground. Right, then level one gets messed up, then you can't do level two because you don't have level one. Blah, blah. But guess what? So the answer to your question is the ultimate goal of air quote FPNA, or I would call finance, because we're a team. Obviously, level one is accounting, right? Level yep. two is FPNA, is level three. Influence the weather, change the weather. It's okay to say yesterday rained. It's like, yes, I know it rained yesterday. Like I got that. Cool. <laughs> right. Tomorrow's sunny. Okay, that's interesting. Or Friday is going to be really bad. You know what's really powerful? Friday is probably going to be really bad. But if we do this, this, and this, it can probably turn it to be sunny. Or Friday is going to be really bad. Let's buy some umbrellas and prepare for it. That is super helpful. That's called strategic. That's called get a seat at the table. Okay, so stop the analogies, Casey. Okay, so level three is influence and change the weather. Okay, what does that mean? There's two categories, in my opinion, of a report. Like if you produce anything, think of it as either category one or two. When you show it to someone, category one, good to know, interesting. Category two, changes their behavior. You want as many category twos as possible. But so what is being strategic? It's two components, two requirements. One, it's doing something that will change someone's behavior. That's requirement number one. And number two, a material impact is made. I, I mean, examples are, I'm going to completely make something up. Uh, we just went through all the data and the P&O and realized that, by the way, did you know all of our best customers come from Minneapolis? Wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, because of, and they, by the way, they all buy on February 3rd for this. It's not, just, so all the money we're spending in every other like state, I say we just triple down on that or replicate it somewhere else. Okay, one, definitely going to change people's behavior mm -hmm. immediately. Two, makes a big impact. That's strategic finance. Vast majority of finance, unfortunately, is category one. We've seen it. Oh, yeah, we've lived it. I, I've lived it. I try to avoid that with my teams. We don't bother stakeholders with stuff that's like eye charts and like, what, what, what's the point? What are you trying to tell me right now? And what I tell me is, how do you want to change my thinking? How do you want to change my, how do you want to reinforce something? One chart, animal pictures. Have a big picture of an elephant and on the bottom it says elephant. Make it very clear what you're trying to explain. Okay, so simple, impactful, behavior changing. That's strategic finance. But it requires data, proper accounting, and reporting, great forecasting. So once again, not, I'm not in any way trying to say that, you know, there's, there's, there's uh, less or more. All of it is required to get to level three. To get to Nirvana, you need the whole stack. So that is my answer to how is FPA at the seat of the table. I, I've never seen it. If you don't have a solid foundation, it's really hard to be the strategic finance partner. I lived in a company that 
our data and things were just, you know, it was a mess. And I spent so much time on that. It made it really hard, you know, to be, to be able to do all the things I'd like to do. I did as many as I could, but you only have so many hours in a day. So it limited the ability to truly be effective. And I think that's what you're getting at is without that foundation. Sure. Can you make a difference? Yes. Can you make the difference you need to? No, you're going to be limited. I guess that another way, do not underinvest in the controllership. Yeah. Do not underinvest because they think it's accounting. Okay. Just account for stuff. Accounting is probably one of the most underappreciated, misunderstood roles of all the finance cousins. <laughs> And, and so I don't, I don't underappreciate it. So I make sure to really invest in my team. And guess what? It pays off massively. My FBA team looks a lot better. Why? Because they have a very strong data set. I, you know? I, I've said this you know, on LinkedIn a couple of times. You know, uh, the best friend of, an F, of FP&A is a good accountant. That's right. That good partner. I love when I was working with somebody that could be like, hey, what's going on here? We could talk through things and, hey, how should we manage this? Or why did this happen? Let's fix it for next month versus, well, I was just told to book this entry or whatever, you know, when you had that strong, it makes a big difference. I've seen it again and again in multiple roles. So I, I'm 100% with you on that. And the other one, this will be a much shorter answer is uh, success of me. Business first, finance second. I would agree. Finance is a tool. So whoever you're out there, if you're a finance air quote person, think business first. So what's the purpose for the business of whatever I'm doing? There unfortunately are times where people just think finance first, finance second, finance third. It's like if you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you don't need to, it's not a hammer, it's a wrench, right? So always think at the end of the day, we service the business. So the best fp a leaders are business first, Finance second, yeah. and you know, kind of an example, a little bit different. But I, uh, you know, I support a business, and every about once a quarter, sales commissions were due the same week as the budget, and they'd always call me and go, "Why is your budget late?" It's like because I'm paying people first. Do you want me to not pay them? I'm happy to drop it and do that. Never once did they say, "Yeah, finish that budget first. Don't exactly. pay our sales people." Right, and that's the example. I was like, "Business first. I don't. They can get mad at me. I don't care. I'm going to pay the people first because that's what matters." At the end of the day, we all service a singular goal is the business. Yeah. Yeah. So I, that, that, that's kind of my analogy to that, that I dealt with. So, you know, we've, we've been talking for a while here and just have a few more questions for you, then we'll let you go. You know, next question I'd, I'd love to ask you is what do you see as the biggest opportunity and risk for FP&A today? So what, you know, kind of the greatest opportunity and risk out there. Oh, it's a growing. I've heard the opportunity one. I'm ready for that. Risk is an interesting one. Um, the opportunity is, I'll just say the blanket statement. I think the office of the CFO is going to evolve into the office of business intelligence. For the longest time, and that's because of lack of tools, lack of the respect and understanding of what it can be, which also is a circular reference to the ability to provide the insights. Um, that's changing now. It used to be things were so manual that it took so long to even close the books before you could even forecast that finance always trail the business. So of course they're not the table because they're just busy doing something back um, and chasing sales and chasing the CEO's vision. Thanks to technology, thanks to data, automation, integration, and what I would call self-reconciling systems, Stripe, HRIS systems like Rippling. Those systems are actually an amazing forcing mechanism to organize your data. They're all self-organized. You have to tag someone's location and they're calm. Guess what? There's all databases. So what's happening in the tech world, CFO tech world, is all those systems are going to start talking to each other. Then instead of spending 80% of your time munching things together in Excel, <laughs> you spend 80% of the time reading the insight. So real-time insight. The CFO function will come from the dark ages into the light because what people forget about is a lot of metrics and a business health must involve money. People talk about the product usage. That's great. At the end of the day, someone even said, I think strategy and money are the same. Like if a lot of people talk about strategy without like P and L at the end of the day, a business, let's call it what it is. It generally just has to generate a profit, right? That's mm -hmm. generally, generally speaking. But, but my point is uh, strategy without finance injected somewhere in there is not a full strategy. Unit economics must have 
finance in it. So, so much insight now must have that follow the money, but the money part was always so delayed in getting reconciled to everything else that was already real time. So once that happens, the office of CFO can finally be not just the reporting monkey, but did you know and start to shed insights that the company doesn't even know about? And that's what I think is the opportunity for FP&A where you become a hero. You come in and, oh my God, I love those sessions where I'm like, one of my FP&A members discovered something. It's all you. Present it. And I just love the CEO on down going, wow, that is so helpful. Thank you. And that's, that's opportunity. And that's because we have the tooling and the start of, you know, et cetera. Risks, honestly, maybe the risk is, you know, with, what do they say, with responsibility, with privilege comes responsibility, you know, getting it wrong. But to me, that's just a high class problem. Sure. But yeah, once you have the data, it's like, why didn't you tell me about this? So the risk is that, but I think it's all good. Uh, I think people under appreciate estimate the air quote CFO umbrella. They think of the CFO as a boring, I must know accounting thing. No, no, it's going to be a really, really fun strategic function that sees everything. I agree with pretty much everything you're saying there. And I think we're seeing a lot of that data. I saw something that said, uh, you know, almost 40% of CFOs, they were hired last year were first time CFOs. And one of the biggest things they look for is an understanding of data. Yes. And, you know, data, data analysis often sits now in finance. My last company, one of the first things the CFO did was move it back under him when he came in, we got a new CFO and he's like, that's under me. Bingo. That is one of the clear signs. If you have a strategic CFO or someone that's more of the first regime, right? If, if a CFO is not pounding the table, I own whatever, you know, data or BI or centralized. And, uh, well, I don't even know how you're going to be insightful. Well, the other thing thing is when I came in 10 years ago, I said, where's all the data product engineering, which I get, I mean, cause they are the Kings and Queens, right? They're the first classes mm-hmm. and they have all of it, but they don't have the money flow. So they can't process a certain thing. So anyways, I think it's going to be shared between obviously product and sales and finance, but finance is finally catching up. I mean, yeah, obviously it's a shared responsibility. Every You have to have a culture throughout the company of data, but finance is a great place in that it's, you know, Switzerland, it's a support function. It doesn't have, it's not like sales where there's often that agenda. I mean, not that there's not an agenda, but it's different. They're very much supporting their function versus a cross-functional that can look at it and say, no, this is the right way to calculate it. And here's why I know you don't like that sales or you don't like that product because it's not as favorable, but it's what we need to move forward. It's the right way to look at it from an economic and financial standpoint. Yeah. Cause the dangerous, the danger of looking at KPIs too granularly is you miss the bigger picture. So by definition, if I had to pick a functional KPI versus a cross functional KPI, I would pick a cross functional KPI, which is, finance or HR or et cetera. Now, I, I like that example. I appreciate that one. I hadn't quite heard it put that way. So thank you. So, you know, a couple of questions we like to ask here are a little more on the personal basis, get to know our uh, guest a little bit more. So the first one is what is something unique about you that you can share with our audience? Something we wouldn't find online. Uh, I've never um, traveled or lived alone in my life. Um, I think I'm maybe scared of my own shadow. I don't even know. <laughs> uh, I, I'm a, I'm a flaming extrovert. Like I, you know, it, it's just, I love the energy of people, um, to an extreme. Um, but yeah, that's a, I, I mean, maybe you could see from my, my, my background, but I, I don't think it's an accident, even though I kind of, it is kind of inadvertent that I helped create a community. Yeah, I I could definitely, just from when I first met you, I could tell you're extroverted, very open to talking to people and get excited and the energy. So that makes sense to me. I can, I can see that. So I appreciate that one. Uh, next question, DataRails is our sponsor and they're a FP&A platform that's built around Excel. So we like to ask everybody and obviously it's finance. Excel has a huge role. What's your favorite Excel formula, feature or function? Oh, yeah, I like it. <laughs> um, ooh, that's a good one. 
And don't say merge and center. We had somebody say merge and center. <laughs> <laughs> and he's actually a Microsoft Excel MVP. It was pretty yeah. funny. Yeah. Formula, function, or what? Feature. Yeah. You know, oh, pivot table. Yeah. P- pivot table. And uh, I mean, we're talking about formula. I actually like s- uh, some if, average if. <laughs> I, I, I know. I use it a lot. Um, pivot table. Okay. We've had that one a few times. I'm a huge pivot table fan. I love power pivot now that you can. What's your answer to that question? Is it power pivot? Or what's your favorite function? A favorite fun. Well, first favorite feature is power query. Probably then followed by power pivot. I love because I'm always cleaning data. Yeah. It just saves so much time. As far yeah. as functions, yeah, I, I I love the new dynamic arrays. I'm a big X lookup, yeah. unique filter, all these new ones, these shaping ones they're building. I love playing oh. with them. Oh, sorry, unique. Now, yeah, I, unique sounds uh, unique is a Google Sheet function. It's also in Excel now. Is it now? Yes, it's new. Sorry, right, I take it back. Unique Trump Summit. No, I. That, yeah, I love new unique. Yeah, they 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 changed the calculation engine when they came out with three sixty five, and it's now dynamic. So all the formulas spill automatically, dynamically, and will adjust. But everybody still thinks it's point to point. So you have a unique, you have a filter, you have a sort, X lookup, which is kind of a modern V lookup, and now they've added a bunch of others. You can stack vertically and horizontally tables. You can drop things from your data set because they dropped the last row. Take take only the first three rows or the bottom three rows and start combining things together with all those formulas. It's pretty crazy. Uh, all right, there's a few functions I probably love more. I just don't even know. What it is. <laughs> no, but that was a very helpful explanation of dynamic versus point to point. That's okay. Now I know. Yeah, there there you go. So there's your. Excel. You can see I'm. Ex- I do a lot of Excel training. I'm an Excel nerd. So. Yeah, totally. Yeah, with my role, unfortunately, I do less modeling. Yeah, more I was going to say, if you're doing a lot of that, I'd be a little worried. I would think you're <laughs> not doing your job very well. I can get, still get down and dirty, but I'm a little slower, and um, and the new kids, so to speak, will crush me with these dynamic ones. Yeah. Uh, I still love to code, just like, you know, how sure. a, as an engineering leader, just mm-hmm. let's get back in there. Yeah, no, sometimes it's great to just sit there and get your hands dirty, right? Spend some time in the model. You know it's not your primary role, and so you enjoy it when you get to do it. But, you know, if you're doing it too much, there's probably a problem. (laughs) So last question here, and then we'll let you go. What advice would you offer to someone starting their career today in FP&A? I cheat with more than one thing. Um, Number one is focus on relationships. I think a lot of people go in thinking about competency. Uh, how good am I in Excel and how fast I can deliver things. Um, so there's a, one of my coaches had a, a quadrant, if you can all visualize as I, as I say this, on the X axis is uh, it's a warm or cold, which is kind of a personality. Mm-hmm. And on the Y axis uh, is competent, incompetent. If you are incompetent and cold, you're done. <laughs> you're kind of done with it, okay if you are obviously these are harsh words i don't mean it but you know if you're incompetent warm you're pitied okay if you're competent and cold you're respected but don't turn your back yeah if you're warm and competent you win so I think a lot of people in finance, they're more analytical creatures. They're, they're more like seek and destroy. They forget about the softer things. And by the way, that includes me. I had to learn, hey, this thing called buy-in, this thing called working relationships, I, I was all about, I got the job done. The answer is this, I'm going to bulldoze you, and this is the answer. Let's not talk about it and waste time. No, no, no. It is as important, if not more important, how you get there than where you're getting to than the destination. How you get there is more important than the destination. By the way, how you get there can determine the destination. So anyways, that's all wrapped into people, 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 people. Yep. I, I'm a big believer, you know, and we call it soft skills. I'm not a fan. Yes. I don't, li- I don't yes. like that term soft yeah. skills, yeah. but yeah. it's huge. As I say, yeah, technical skills will probably get you your first job. That's right. Uh, you're, your soft skills are going to get you promoted and going to advance your career. Without them, you're limited. At the at the at the senior levels, it's all relationship based. Mm-hmm. I'm not modeling anything. Yeah, 
right? And and so you, you said it really well. Get you your first job, which implies the rest. <laughs> um, and you know, instead of soft skills, you call it EQ, right? That's a very yeah, exactly. Thing. Yep. All right, but uh, high EQ can get you, I think, farther than high IQ. I I agree. If you if you have to pick one of them, I'd much rather have the EQ than the IQ. By the way, bad analogy. Con artists. They are experts at EQ. Mm-hmm. Right? And think about it. I mean, we're confident or not, like it's all about psychology. I mean, if you can relate with someone, whatever, that's a really bad example, but basically some of the best salespeople, right? Right? Some of the best salespeople basically, right, have the same kind of skill set. Yeah. So it's that connecting with people. That is that is a skill. You know, Excel is a skill too, but let me tell you, I'd rather have people skills, right? So and you yeah. marry that with a good Excel skill background golden yeah I, I we had someone on the show the other day that has both of those and just a phenomenal oh. modeler but great people skills and it can explain things just to a you know a three-year-old like right talk to me like i'm five and it's just everybody gets it. it's like oh that makes so much sense versus let me give you the technical jargon here and 20 minutes later you're like okay can you leave the room now <laughs> and the career practicality is you have more options to expand into things mm-hmm. and you go to product you can go to sales, but if you're just really technical and hard, you kind of got to stay in that same swim lane, which is okay if that's what you want to do. But once you have people skills, people skills is across every role in the world. Excel skills is only part of 10% of the roles, right? So just think about that. Great point. Well, I know we're uh, up on our time here, but thank you so much, Casey. I've loved having you on the show. It's been a great conversation. I'm really excited to share this with our audience and I hope you have a great weekend there. Enjoy the Bay Area and the uh, fog and hopefully a little bit of sun. (laughs) Thanks for having me. Thanks, Casey.